And here we go, uplink number 16. I can see uh, Mark McCorkran in orbit, which is always very good news indeed. Uh, and uh, we're going to unmute you and uh, welcome you aboard. Mark, how are you doing? Afternoon, Alex. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, weather's changed. So, uh, well, from where I'm sitting, at least it's as, as clear as it ever was. But no, outside it's uh, rainy and cloudy. So uh, in some sense, good to see the end of the drought. Um, but uh, it's going to make cycling a bit harder, but that's another topic for you and me to discuss at another point. Uh, uh, another topic, uh, certainly one of our favorites. But I guess uh, what we're about to talk to in the next hour or so is uh, a, a place where weather has no bearing on things, at least not in the traditional sense, certainly. Um, uh, I, I guess, you know, I got to confess, hands up. I mean, we do like a snappy title when it comes to Uplink. Um, <laughs> but uh, the concept of flying in space is... Uh, I guess you could say it's a bit of a misnomer at some level, isn't it? Well, flying, yes. So uh, <laughs> with no atmosphere, certainly above, you know, um, a couple of hundred kilometers at least, there's no atmosphere really to affect you. There is a bit, of course, the space station gets dragged by the, the, the very small amount of resi residual atmosphere up there at a few hundred kilometers, and that brings the space station down little by little. So if we call that flying, um, uh, but but more generally operating how do you get how do you once the spacecraft are in orbit or on their way somewhere else how do you navigate how do you um ensure that the science instruments are able to do what they're able to do when they arrive at their targets how do you get over the right part of a planet how do you land on something um so yeah spacecraft operations uh, that's a, a, a big speciality that we have at the european space Operations center in Darmstadt in Germany, where you visited. And uh, the guests this afternoon are part of the teams there that run of all, our, all of our missions um, in space. Um, and of course, you know, we run, run many, the science missions, the earth observation missions, telecommunications, navigation, and so on. So there's lots and lots of stuff uh, that, uh, that we deal with. But uh, today, yeah, the two guests are um, people with a great deal of experience in solar system science. Uh, Armel Ubo, um, who is currently working, um, uh, well, more importantly, what she has worked on in the past is the Rosetta mission. And that's something I've got the, because I say that more importantly, I have the polo shirt on today, the Rosetta polo shirt. Um, that, of course, ended in 2016, but she worked on it for many years. And she'll tell us what she's working on today. Um, and Tom Ormston, uh, who also has worked at solar system missions on Mars and is now working in Earth observation. So they're both very experienced spacecraft engineers, operators, um, pilots, if you want. Uh, and uh, yeah, lots and lots of interesting things to hear from them today. Indeed. Well, there's a, there's a lot to sink into. And um, you're going to have to forgive me the occasional Star Trek or Star Wars reference, because, of course, uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, anybody who's seen any of those films or the series has always thought about what it is to pilot in space. And what makes me so excited about this is we're talking to people that actually do that. So I guess without further ado, we're going to bring them aboard into the live stream. And uh, well, what an interesting scene. Fantastic. There's Tom and uh, uh, Armel should be joining Hi, Tom. any minute now. Tom, how are you doing? Are you receiving? I am indeed. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, I think communications technology is something we should be good at at uh, the operations <laughs> center. Well, I, uh, that's definitely something we would love to chat with you about. And uh, it, it looks like you are in a, a mission control of sorts. And Through the uh, magic of technology. Indeed, it's wonderful. And uh, Armel, how are you doing? Are, are you receiving? Hi, yes, I can hear you very well. Fantastic. Um, Hi, Armel. Good afternoon. Indeed. Hi. Perfect. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, for those of us just joining us, Armel is broadcasting from the International Museum of the Ukulele. Uh, <laughs> 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 absolutely fantastic. Well, um, well, I've got to say, um, Armel, um, just uh, just behind you is uh, an even more interesting object. Is uh, I guess you could say an anthropomorphized rendition of, uh, I guess, a, a probe, an instrument, a little robot that uh, that we all know and love. Exactly, that's uh, Rosetta and Philae, um, which were very successfully turned into uh, uh, into cartoons during the mission, um, which um, resulted basically in everyone falling in love with uh, with this mission and with these little guys. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an extraordinary thing 
that happened. I mean, uh, uh, when I think about the technical complexity of the, the Rosetta mission, not just the science that it yielded, but also just what was required um, to, to literally catch up with a comet and land something on it, it really is utterly astounding. And I, I suppose that's where someone like you comes in because it seems like it was almost a, a bit of a dance that had to happen. Could you walk us through that experience? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, a, a mission like Rosetta, it's a teamwork. Uh, that's not something that you do as, as an individual. Um, and in the case of Rosetta, it was really international. Um, not only because the team itself uh, in which I worked was international. Uh, in fact, I, I like to often to joke that we had more nationalities than people in the team, which I quite nice. Uh, but also because we had instruments from other agencies on board the spacecraft. Um, and I think it's really, really important to stress that um, a mission of this size can only be successful with a very wide cultural background. Um, and then you need also to have experts in many fields because you need people who are able to navigate the spacecraft, you need uh, people to work the ground stations in order to contact the spacecraft, and then you need people to daily monitor the spacecraft, see how it's going, uplink the commands, um, and then of course the uh, science teams who decide um, well, what they want to observe about the comet, design the instruments, and then do the science. So to reduce all of this down to my fundamental misunderstanding of things, what you're saying is it isn't a keyboard and a joystick and that's it. There's a, there's a lot more to it. Exactly, and certainly not a joystick. That would be really very nice. Um, we, we keep more. asking for one, but they won't give us one. Uh, we've tried. <laughs> um, there's also one thing which is very important, a mission like Rosetta, which is an interplanetary mission, which is very far from the Earth, has to deal with what we call propagation delay. This means that the spacecraft is so far away that even the signal, which travels at the speed of light, needs minutes to reach the spacecraft. In the case of Rosetta, it was up to 45 minutes. So you send a command to the spacecraft, it takes three quarters of an hour to reach the spacecraft and then another 45 minutes to come back. So this means that you cannot command directly with a joystick. You basically have to prepare commands beforehand to think of everything in advance and then you uplink one week worth of commands which the spacecraft will execute. So Let's, let's go right back to the beginning because you were involved in Rosetta for a long time. Um, I, I don't mean to say that in a rude way there, but uh, I mean, we know the mission started. It was uh, my first mission. Okay. Now, were you involved before it actually launched? So the launch was in 2004 um, because of course there's a lot of work that goes in in preparation stages, how to plan trajectories, actually how to plan a mission in advance. Um, were you involved at that stage? Well, not so much because I actually joined and uh, the, agency, the agency and the Rosetta mission six months before launch, uh, directly after my studies. So I was, uh, I was there basically not really having a clue what was going on around and learning. I, I hit the floor running and, and learned basically as things were going. Um, what was really nice in the team is that from the beginning, uh, because it was going to be a very long mission, um, it was decided that the team would be composed of um, older experienced engineers and younger unexperienced people who would then learn from these um, older engineers and then would carry on as the others would slowly retire. And this worked very well. Now, so you joined then, if, if I'm right, you joined in the gap um, between, of course, the, 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 the cancelled or postponed first launch um, so for those who don't remember, Rosetta was supposed to launch in 2003, but because of a failure of one of our um, of Ariane 5 rockets, Rosetta was postponed. But that meant changing of the target completely. So we couldn't catch up with the original um, comet Vertinen, but uh, it, it then had to pick and design a whole new set of um, ways of getting to 67P Churumov and Gerasimenko. So was that something which you know, really made life very hard in that first six months, that first year? 
Well, it did make life uh, hard, um, maybe not so much for us because we used this time to perfect our procedures and to make things better. Um, but it was a problem, for instance, for the lender because the new, the new comet, Cholyumov Kiasimenko, was much bigger than Comet Virtanen. And this means that, for instance, the, the feet of the lender were not designed to land on such a, a big rock. Uh, it could not really take the, the pressure. Um, now, remember, the, the lender was about 100 kilo, so the size and weight of a washing machine. But on the comet, it would weigh about one gram, so an envelope. And still, that was, that was too much. So really, the amount of design and testing that went on there was really really difficult right so tom so i'm bringing you in um you're currently working in earth observation but uh you know you had a you had a an, you know before that you had an honorable job working with the solar system guys and the space yeah. science so uh <laughs> what's your background uh, so yeah um you're right i've been at esoc for oof, 15 years now actually 15 years in about two weeks time i'll have been at esoc for uh, for that amount of time and the first half yeah i did in uh, solar system on mars express which was our ESA's first mission to mars and uh, it was a two-year mission and that was 17 years ago um we're still flying uh it's uh, got a bit more duct tape around the edges at the moment to keep it held together um but it really is the little spacecraft that could and it, it keeps on going and delivering science so i was really pleased to spend well, seven eight years uh, on Mars Express, uh, make, being a part of that mission, and I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about it later on. Um, but since then, yeah, I've been in Earth observation, um, working on a mission called EarthCare, which is one of our Earth explorers. It's uh, not launched yet, uh, but I was working on the preparation. Of course, when we fly spacecraft, we don't just sit down in front of the console when the rocket goes up and start flying. It's many years of preparation before that. Uh, so I was working on that with EarthCare. I've also worked on Cryosat, which is our ice mission and uh, very recently transferred to oh no wait, where is it there on, on my shirt um <laughs> uh sentinel one um which is one of our copernicus spacecraft um which is pretty much the world's biggest earth observation program certainly uh, the biggest public earth observation program the world's ever seen and um i'm really really happy i'm quite new in that job but it's a very exciting mission and uh, so i'm very excited to be getting to grips with that and I've got the t-shirt already, so I guess it kind of fits. <laughs> well, you've got the t-shirt, but you've also got the background as well, Tom. I mean, uh, uh, tell yeah. us a little bit about that scene behind you, because so, uh, that, that's that's looking extremely cool. It is extremely cool in there. So uh, back there is the, the main control room. Uh, well, not really back there. Back there is a green screen. But um, uh, that's where we work for the most critical bits of any mission um, at ESOC, so at European Space Operations Center. Um, and it does look very like something out of the movies, which we like very much, uh, but it plays an important role functionally as well. Uh, I say we only do it for the most critical phases. I actually don't usually work in that room, uh, nor does Armel. We've got our own uh, sort of more homely, small control rooms, which uh, are called dedicated control rooms, which is where we do the day-to-day -day business of flying a spacecraft. Uh, but sometimes, particularly for launches, but also for major events like when uh, Rosetta landed on the comet, uh, or if we arrive at a planet, uh, we'll go into this room behind me, uh, which is where we can get the whole team together. And that's the true power of this room, apart from looking very nice, um, is that everybody involved is is there in one place and we're connected by headsets. Uh, we can talk to each other. Uh, we've got different voice loops that allow us to communicate. Um, there's a lot of different roles uh, laid out. And we can talk about that in a bit uh, if you want about who does what in the room. Um, but basically everyone that's involved uh, from experts that know about the inner workings of the satellite to people that know about the dishes on the ground or how the software on our consoles works even the people that order the sandwiches uh, they're all in one place all connected all there um, as this amazing sort of hive mind that allows us to safely uh, fly the spacecraft during those critical phases when lots of things can happen at once and uh, I think we'll get onto that as well but um, before that which is actually something I'm about to do because uh, I'm about to work on the launch of a Spanish satellite called Sayasat, which we're launching in August. Um, so we're just about to start our simulations campaign. So we'll be going back into that room um, just next week, uh, now appropriately socially distanced, but uh, we'll be going back into that room to start what we call a simulations campaign, which is the training period where we go in there with a the simulator and um,
Oh, hello there. Oh, yep. Sorry, I think you had lost me for a second. Okay. Yeah. All good. All good. Now, please continue. Sorry, I just lost you for a second there, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, uh, yeah. This is uh, this this room. This simulations campaign is how we we practice uh, what we're going to be doing in there. So we run through um, anywhere from ten to twenty times the actual operation we're going to be doing. Um, and uh, we've got very talented simulations officers um, who we both love and hate. Uh, they live in a in a little cave underneath the room there uh, called the Sim Studio. Uh, and they have a model of the satellite that uh, they pipe up to our consoles. Uh, they can also see us on cameras all around the room and they can listen to everything we're saying. They can see our monitors. Uh, so they they are the gods in this this thing and they simulate what we're going to do so to us sitting in the room it feels like the real deal it, it, there's there's almost nothing to take you out of it and you get stressed you get nervous and you you lose yourself and forget that you're in a simulation i see amel nod, <laughs> nodding in agreement with that you completely lose yourself and it starts off normally so things start normally everything goes according to plan and you just sort of learn what you're doing and get used to being in the room and how to communicate with each other and things like that but then it gets more difficult and the co contingency simulations we call them um, are where it gets really fun uh, and a bit scary and stressful because then they'll start to make things go wrong and, and watch the team react and it's not just highly technical like oh they'll break this component on the spacecraft and we need to think about the right software change or the right command to send to fix it um, it's a lot more down to earth things as well they'll come and unplug your keyboard and you you need to know you need to know what to do. What if your keyboard breaks? Do do you know who to call? Do you, is there one spare in a locker somewhere? They'll call you up. They called me up and said, right, uh, you ate the chicken at lunch. You're sick. Walk out of the room and don't come back. And it's don't like, eat okay. the chicken. Yeah, don't eat the yeah, chicken. It, I, I walked I'm, out of the room I'm, and uh, yeah. I'm just, they were particularly picking on you, right? Post Brexit, chlorinated chicken. Well, I think chicken, they were picking on me because I went out of the room and uh, it took 20 minutes before anyone noticed I was gone. So uh, that's how critical my position was. Uh, but uh, but no, they, they'll do things like that uh, to force you to, to think outside the box and to try and make you realize where you might have holes in what you're doing. And they're very clever. They'll look at what you're doing. We, we run everything from procedures. Everything we do is procedures and checklists and things like that. And uh, when we were doing one, we were loading our procedures from our laptops, our, our work laptops, which connect to the Wi-Fi everywhere. And they noticed we were doing this. And so they killed the Wi-Fi and said, right, how are you going to fly now? And um, it, they do things like this. And it sounds very mean. And we give them a lot of stick for it. But actually, Le learning by doing is the best possible training and they make it very clear from the start it's not about blame it's not about making you look bad it's not about showing you up or anything like that it's it's about a learning experience and if something goes wrong it's about how do we work together to make sure that wouldn't go wrong in real life and the last simulation you do they usually do one that's completely normal and uh <laughs> When that you do that normal. one, it's so boring, isn't it, Mel? You're, you're, I'm sure you agree. It just feels yeah, yeah. so boring, and you feel then so like ready for for what you're going to do. So, so I, I'm just kind of interested. You know, uh, I know you guys. I like you guys. Um, it, it must take a weird personality, right, to be to want to actually take on that job of being one of the simulators, uh, the guys down down in the basement, as you say. So, uh, is it something people aspire to at ESOC? Is it kind of a promotion, or is it something you get shoved to if you've, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you can't get on with everybody else? I, I, no, it's a joke. But uh. no, I think I think one of the, it's a, such an important job, and you need to have such a good understanding of the the background of everything that these guys are actually kind of heroes. Um, I mean, yeah, they, they really know about every single system at ESOC from, yeah, the control system to the ground stations to um, the coffee machine, absolutely everything. And so, the people as well, which always amazes yeah, me. They, the they see how the well, people work funny. together and try and make sure that you develop good relationships. I mean, they, they really, yeah, I have nothing but respect for them. That's not what I would tell them to their face necessarily, but. Um. <laughs> but, but is it, you know, my, my, my brother is a, um, an airline uh, captain and he's now actually in, in the last year become a training captain. So he, he does exactly that. I mean, he kind of works a lot in the simulator. He flies as well, but most of his stuff is now in the simulator. Um, and it's because he's, got long-standing experience as a captain himself that he's able to know all that. So is it actually a role which people take on sort of relatively late in their careers or is it a separate career path? Genuine question now, because as you said, 
uh, you've got to know a lot about how things work. So actually having done the job for real for a number of years probably is an important component. I think there's a mix. Um, and we see people yeah. who do it as a career. We see some people that drop into it and drop out of it. I mean, a lot of the skills that we have as spacecraft operations engineers are a good background for it. So, mm -hmm. so you do get transfer in, in both directions, people going yes. from being okay. an engineer to, to being a simulations officer and, and the other way around as well. Um, mm -hmm when they decide they want to and stop also, being mean to people. Also, what happens is that usually um, one simulation officer gets assigned to a mission because, you know, you really need to get to learn the mission by heart to be able to break it for. <laughs> um, but then that also makes you a single point failure. So usually what happens is that you will have a very experienced sim officer and a more junior one. And they sort of learn like this by sharing the tasks and by, yeah, learning to be mean from each other. <laughs> you know, what's so fascinating about this is because um, from my perspective, so much of this is, you know, um, so technical. You know, this is like the apex of, uh, you know, uh, human um, technological development. But it actually sounds like uh, a, a big, if not the biggest component of this is the human factor. The decisions yes. that you make in response to data and how you work on teams and all those aspects um, that I guess are uh, a little harder to plan for. You just have to train. Yeah, I guess to this respect, you can sort of compare us to the Borgs, um, <laughs> but not so dependent on the Queen. Uh, <laughs> but basically, the idea, especially of these simulations, is to have us work as a single entity. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's what I was saying earlier is basically this multicultural background makes the sum more than, uh, um, sorry, what is it? The end product is more than the sum of its components. Right. Exactly, yeah. No, I, I agree completely. And, and it is one of the things you learn in the, the simulations campaign is, is you can be brilliant technically, but, but just being brilliant technically isn't enough. And mm. in fact, people talk about high tech and how do you make sure that it, it doesn't like that you don't have make a mistake or something like that. And that's another thing that you learn in the simulations campaign is, is flying spacecraft is not about not making a mistake. Human error is something that is always going to be there. Uh, it's, it's wrong to think that you can beat it or cheat it somehow. Um, a lot of what we learn is how to manage human error and how to make sure we've got enough checks and how to make sure we work together such that we do make mistakes, but those are spotted before they cause any problems, uh, before they get to the real hot end of things. So, so let, let me go to another bunch of slightly, you know, uh, interesting people who work at ESOC, um, uh, flight dynamics, um, uh, and, you know, how, particularly with, obviously with the interplanetary missions, trying to find trajectories which get us efficiently and as quickly as possible to the location we want to go to. Um, and, you know, we, we're doing that with Bepi Colombo at the moment with this incredibly complex trajectory uh, involving two Earth flyby, uh, one Earth flyby, two Venus, and then six at Mercury. Um, but let's go back to Rosetta, which, it, you know, had a very complicated uh, trajectory as well. And I think, you know, often when, when we were putting out the PR material about this, describing the mission to the public, there were lots of sort of big number things like we're flying at this number of thousand kilometers per hour and, you know, we're millions of kilometers away from the Earth. But you already touched on the one, Armel, about the distances involved and the light travel time. And I think one thing people don't quite realize is that spacecraft trajectories and you know the actual flying act is a very precise but somehow quite a slow thing planned weeks yes. in advance tiny nudges so give us some sense for you know maybe not just a flyby but also um, a course trajectory um, change you know post flyby you see that you're not quite on the right trajectory how do we know that how do we measure exactly where we are and how fast we're going and then what do we do to slightly change the trajectory Okay, first of all, I'm not a flight dynamics expert. <laughs> uh, no, but you, you have to implement the outcomes at least, right? Neither of us yes, are clever yes. enough to be flight dynamics. <laughs> <laughs> they are like maths gods, they're, they're geniuses. I mean, they work like nine dimension matrices in their heads in seconds. It's unbelievable. Well, um, it, uh, if, if I could pause you just for one moment, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, so tell us a little bit about that because, uh, you know, not everyone, and certainly we have some wonderful people joining us on our live stream as well. Um, you know, what is flight dynamics? What, why is that so complicated? 
Okay, F Flight Dynamics is basically the, the team who's responsible for calculating the trajectory of the spacecraft um, and the maneuvers that it has to do. So to take again the example of, uh, of Mark, if we want to do a, a flyby, so that's also what we call a gravitational assist, um, the idea is we fly around the planet in order to modify a little bit the trajectory of our spacecraft. And depending how close to the planet you fly and at which point around the planet you fly, you will modify your trajectory differently. So to make an example, um, if this is my planet and my spacecraft arrives like this, if I fly underneath the planet, I will tend to go up. And if I fly on the side of the planet, I will turn, I will turn to the side. So in order to decide how much and where, how much you want to turn and where to you, you want to turn, you need to know exactly above which point you want to fly um, above the planet. And here we're really talking about a box which is uh, meters, so absolutely tiny. Um, and flight dynamics are the people uh, doing this calculation. What they also calculate is if they uh, notice that we're going to miss the box, say by, I don't know, three kilometers, um, they're going to calculate the uh, maneuvers which are necessary in order to aim at that box. Um, so that means we would need to turn the spacecraft because the thrusters are usually positioned only on one side of the spacecraft. So, you know, you can go like this or you can turn and go like this. Um, so you need to move the spacecraft around and then you need to calculate how long you're going to switch on the thrusters. Because this uh, will basically end up in a different, um, what we call a delta V, so a difference of, uh, of speed at the end of the maneuver. Wow. And I mean, the thing is with flight dynamics as well is that it's, even this explanation does, doesn't do them justice about yes. how complicated it gets because ultimately, I mean, we think about these things and we think, okay, this is sort of the stuff that we learned at school. Planets are planets are spheres and we go in these circular orbits and things like that. Um, maybe even we've played a bit of Kerbal Space Program and we kind of know the way it goes, but um, we certainly have. Uh, but uh, actually, I mean, like the gravity of a planet alone, it's, it's more lumpy. Planets are more like potatoes mm -hmm. compared for their gravitational field, not just spheres. And so you've got to navigate that. And then there are many other effects when you fly around Earth with the Earth observation missions. Our atmosphere reaches up to our spacecraft. It's very mm -hmm. thin but it's variable, like just like weather here on Earth, and we have to compensate for the drag, which is this unpredictability. Uh, so you've got all of these sorts of effects uh, coming together that make it way, way more complicated than just sort of basic Newton's laws. Right. And the thing is, again, so, but a lot of this is not joysticking. This is not sort of flying through a box at a certain time. It's planned way in advance. And, you know, the longer you do it in advance, the smaller you have to move things essentially because exactly. that builds up over time. But then, and this means also the less fuel you will consume because uh, fuel is a finite um, uh, thing on the spacecraft. So, you know, if you wait too long and you need to use uh, five kilos of fuel as opposed to doing your, manu your maneuver some weeks before and consuming 100 grams of fuel, that can really make a huge difference, right? And so, you know, how, how do we? How do we even know where the spacecraft are? I mean, I know that sounds like a weird thing. Again, you know, you know, as, as Tom was just mentioning, we need to know where the Earth is. We need to know its lumpiness. We need to know where the Moon is. We need to know where all the sort of gravitational things. But we need to know where the spacecraft is, and so that brings us to a whole other component. Um, you know, the, the the ground stations which beam signals up and down, but they don't only do that, right? They they help us know where things are. Yeah, I mean. Um... I'm sure Armel will answer for, for the planetary missions in a moment. Things have actually got a lot easier around Earth in, um, well, the past couple of decades because we've started fitting GPS receivers to our satellites. Uh, so we take advantage. Just, I mean, GPS doesn't just tell you how to get to the supermarket here on Earth, um, but we can also pick it up on our satellites as well. And it tells us very, very precisely where we are. Uh, we had an earlier version um, from the French space agency, Kinez, called Doris, which is sort of upside down GPS. There they have uh, transmitters around the Earth that beam up and we, uh, we, we say where we, we are based on those, sort of navigating by beacons. But uh, now around Earth, we can tell our position by GPS, which opens the door to a, a lot of very exciting things. For example, around Earth now, we do what we call position tagged commanding. We used to command our satellites to say, at this time, do this. 
but because of the drag and everything that got inaccurate and you wouldn't know where you were now we can say when you fly over paris take a picture and because the satellite knows where it is it can do that extremely accurately and paris is an example but that could be something much more critical like a, a cyclone or the aftermath of an earthquake or something like that with disaster response so uh, that's really revolutionized earth observation but i guess Armel right. can tell you when we go beyond that uh, yeah. how we we spot them now just because it, it, it would be the right thing to do when you say gps you mean satellite navigation it's not just the us gps system we also use presumably galileo as part of that now yeah uh, at the moment Baidu we don't so okay. um so to start with we just use gps um this is because uh it, it's the well-known secret in the in the space world that our technology is not high tech uh, some of our instrumentation is extremely cutting edge but the satellites themselves are actually very low tech they're based on very old technology because for us in operations reliability is king so we want it to be as reliable as possible and queen. something that's old sorry <laughs> queen yeah yeah <laughs> sorry reliability is 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 king or queen is is gender neutral um but uh um the reliability is the thing and something that's old we know everything that can break in it we've got hundreds of hours of experience thousands or millions of how it works uh, and for that reason so far we've only ever used gps receivers because they've been around the longest uh, so this is meaning america's gps uh, right. we do now have receivers that uh, we will be launching on our new spacecraft very soon uh, that are now gps and galileo but uh, you can see Galileo, Europe's navigation system has been around for quite some time, um, but it's only just now we're beginning to dip our toe into the water and say, right, we're, we're confident enough that we can start using that on a, on a spacecraft for a mission critical use. Okay. And so Armel, for the, the, the question of, you know, once you're at Mars or you're out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, you know, and, and it is one of those weird things, how do we know where we are? Yeah, because you cannot use navigation anymore because you are out of the space of the navigation satellites. So what we do is we actually use the signal of the spacecraft, um, and we we look how it is modified by its speed. This is called the the Doppler. Um, this is a well-known um, astronomy uh, behavior that when something comes closer to you. Um, its light is shifted uh, towards the blue. This is also what happens when uh, you have the, uh, the fire brigade, which is uh, going through a street. As it passes in front of you, the sound will change, become uh, deeper. And this is, um, uh, this is what we use. And by measuring exactly how much, sorry, uh, by measuring exactly the difference in this signal, we can find out um, in which direction the spacecraft is moving and how it is changing. So that will give you the, the distance, how far it is. But then when you are uh, even further away to, uh, um, well, to take again the example of Rosetta, that tells you exactly where your spacecraft is with re relation, in relation to the Earth. But the problem is that then you're trying to navigate towards the comet and you don't exactly know where the comet is. So you want to get closer to an object, but you don't know where it is. Um, so it's like playing this uh, children game where you have your eyes closed and you're trying to, uh, to bang on the floor and there's a, a pot and people are telling you, oh, you're getting closer, or you're getting uh, further away. Um, so what we do in this case, uh, we take pictures and we try to aim at having the object in the center of the picture and if it happens to be uh, in the upper left corner, then we know we need to move in this direction. But the spacecraft is not exactly aiming at the, the comet or the planet, but is aiming a little bit off and we slowly correct in that way. So um, I wondered if um, getting away from just the, uh, uh, the, the technical requirements at all for a moment, I mean, I'm so curious because I'll never forget the first time I drove a car, for instance. Right. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, invariably, you know, it might belong to uh, a parent or a, a very lovely sibling or a good friend or something like that. That's a big responsibility. But walk us through the emotions of taking the controls of something that it's not just what it represents in terms of pure investment, but also the investment of time and the inevitable hopes that people have for things. I mean, these missions take years, sometimes decades to put together. Right. So how, how do you balance that sense of responsibility with needing to make decisions? I mean, we touched on it 
a little bit before, but um, when you turn the ignition in something like that, um, that's a really big deal. Yeah, it is. And I mean, um, I think we, we, we did touch on it before, and I think the, the team thing is is impossible to emphasize enough because you never, I, I, I don't know you to agree, Amel, I, I never feel personal responsibility. I feel responsible as part of the team, but I never feel it's only on my shoulders. Uh, it's it's definitely something that, that I work on, um, but it's a group effort. And so you feel sort of strengthened and buoyed by that. Um, although there are moments, I'm sure we've all had them, where, mm -hmm. where you're sending something particularly scary to the satellite and, uh, or you have a particularly Hibernate. tense moment. Sorry? Hibernate. Hibernate, yeah, for you, yeah, yeah. So, um, and knowing as well the different things that can be in there as well. For example, now uh, with space debris being a very big topic at the end of our Earth observation satellite missions, we have to do something called passivation. So basically turning the satellite off and removing anything that could explode or, or make it more dangerous. Um, but of course, we know when we're flying that we have those commands sitting there on our control system, which will effectively kill the satellite. Now, at the end of life, that's what we want to do. But um, but it's very scary seeing them lurking there and knowing that that it's got the capability to kill itself. <laughs> that that I mean, raises the the other question. Then you know, there's the personal responsibility for these things. Um, working within a team and but but you work on them for many years as well so you you inevitably get attached to them as sort of a an environment but going back to the thing we raised right at the beginning i mean the thing behind you there armel and no i'm not going to cry you're not going to make that happen today <laughs> um, <laughs> um you know it, it, we know that there, there can be in certain cases at least much more of an attachment um that, that comes from being Working with something that has its quirks, it doesn't, you know, you, you get to know the traits and the flaws and oh, you can't turn it, you know, you can't make it go to it much, much more lights go into the left at this point in its mission. Um, how, how big a deal does that become during the mission and also at the end? Um, because, you know, that that's become like an old car. I mean, Alex mentioned the car yes. analogy, right? I mean, and, and you know about driving old cars, right? So uh... Yes, I, I was exactly going to say that it's, it's exactly like a car. Um, okay, I think it also depends a lot on people. You know, people get attached to cars and people just don't get attached to cars. Um, but when you have an old piece of machinery that you've been driving for years, if not, you know, tens of years, you know all its quirks. You know, oh yeah, if I break a little bit hard, it's going to pull to the right, so I'd better be careful. Um, all these things. Um, you, you anthropomorphize, you give it a personality. And uh, eventually... Definitely switch off the mission um it's it gets really difficult uh, when you spent a long long time on a mission um or i think also a set of missions i don't really have experience with that but maybe tom you can uh, yeah i mean le leaving missions is 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 difficult as well because you I guess you have all the things that you would have of a, of a car or even of a parent and things like that. You you want to make sure that it's in good hands. I remember I still check in on Mars Express from time to time and I, I still tut when they do certain things, even though they're doing an amazing job flying it. Oh, I don't know if I would have done it that way. Um, but uh, but you, you do, you get, get this huge attachment to it. And you, I've, what you said about anthropomorphizing them is completely true. And uh, you were lucky on Rosetta because you had the little cartoons made, but... Uh, but we still come to know our satellites. Mars Express, for example, once we forgot to send any message out on social media um, when it was when it was its birthday, the day it was launched uh, a few years ago, and uh, it broke horribly. It sulked. We couldn't get any signal from it for five hours. It was very upset that we'd forgot. So we never forget its birthday now. We make sure to, uh, to always <laughs> acknowledge it. It was just, uh, what was it, two days ago. So happy birthday, Mars Express. And uh, hopefully that'll keep it flying safely. Uh, but they also know when to get you, uh, whether it's the satellite itself or space debris. It never happens conveniently on a Wednesday afternoon mm -hmm. where you've not got much on. It'll always happen on 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning when you thought, you know what, this is going to be a quiet weekend and uh, you plan to have a nice lie-in or something. That's when the satellite will break or something will go <laughs> wrong and we'll need to Or respond. when things get too quiet and you get too comfortable. You know, like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we haven't had a problem in weeks. This is going to be OK. And that's when something happens. Yeah. So how does that actually work? I mean, is there like a red phone next to the bed? Because like when you're, you know, watching a movie, there's always that phone 
you know, on the nightstand that it just rings and it's just like, it's always 3 a.m. And it's just like, I've got to go. Is, is that how it works? Is it, is there it is a phone, but it's not red. It's more of a 20 year old Nokia um, than a red <laughs> phone. Uh, so, again, reliable and basic. But, um, exactly. With the most horrible ringtone and the loudest thing you can find. You can't miss it. Amazing. So as a, as a specific it's example, it's a specific example of that. Um, take us to the moment when Rosetta phoned home, uh, well, well, Philae rather, uh, phoned home. Um, because I think you, you were one of the very first people to hear that, right? Um, the yes. Month, months after the, the landing and then hiding in a dark place and then suddenly it came um, That alive. was actually almost exactly four years ago. No, sorry, uh, six years ago. Uh, five was, years um, ago. 15 or five years ago, five yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, as I said, I'm not flight dynamics, so, you know, the math is not my thing. Yes, well, um, in, in this case, it was... Um, um, okay, where to start? Um, we, ha we have always a, a set of alarms which are defined on certain uh, parameters of the spacecraft. You know, for instance, um, if something gets too hot or um, if something is suddenly starting to draw too much uh, current, then there's an alarm that, uh, that gets uh, uh, triggered. And then whenever we have contact with the spacecraft, um, we also have so uh, someone sitting right in front of the spacecraft, which is called the spacecraft controller. And this person is the first line. And in case an alarm is triggered, we have a procedure that we tell her or him exactly what to do. Um, so that could be, you know, send this command to switch off a heater to, uh, oh my God, this is terrible, call someone immediately. Um, and in the case of, uh, of Philae, there was a, a set of parameters uh, which had been uh, defined uh, basically to tell us that the, the lender was trying to call home. And on that day, all these parameters suddenly lit up and the um, spacecraft controller first double checked that it was real because, you know, sometimes we also have uh, false positives uh, because, yeah, it could be many reasons. Um, and when this was confirmed, well, he took the phone and called the on-call engineer, which was not me. Um, but yeah, because I was taking care of the lender, um, wanted to be sure that he interpreted correctly what was happening. So I was about to, uh, to go and um, uh, brush my teeth. It was a quiet evening. Um, just before a nice weekend, and um, and yeah, suddenly we got the call that Chile had woken up. Um, so suddenly it was like someone kicking in the uh, aunt house. Everyone started <laughs> to check things and to verify and to um, to make sure that it was real. But again, there was nothing that we could do in uh, in real time because of this propagation delay. So it was more. Um, starting to prepare things for the coming passes and for the coming week. I think you, you then got immortalized, right? I think you are cleaning your teeth in one of the cartoons that was made. I after. am, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let me pick up then and just, just follow that a little bit further because there's that anthropomorphization, there's that contact. Now, you got, you're steely engineers, right? You're not scientific romantics. I mean, you know, we're just sort of floating. But... I, I, um, to what extent is it reasonable for human beings to sort of think of these these robots, these boxes of electronics with, you know, and then they don't have AI, they're not thinking for themselves, they're, really, they're, they're, they're telepresence extensions of us in some sense. Do we think of them as our avatars? Because there's a lot of focus in spaceflight on, on the human experience and astronauts, the overview effect and so on. But you guys work with, with robotic missions. And for some people that just, you know, isn't the same. But I mean, and this is a rhetorical question. I know exactly how I feel about it. Um, you know, the, these these are our representatives going to places that we can't go. Either it's too far away, it's too cold, it's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, but 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 you know, it's, it seems to me at least to be very important that we represent that honestly. That it's human beings operating something on behalf of human beings, whether that's for disaster relief or for exploration, for inspiration. So I, I, you know, I think that's something which is often forgotten about what we do in ESA is that it's, 
you know, the astronauts are very directly contactable, but people like you are also at the front of exploring and engaging with the universe. It just happens to be an electron bunch box of electronics somewhere out there in between us and that experience. But I think we also experience that as well sometimes. I mean, that's why I love doing events like this, because we talk. Events like this where your comms drop out, yeah. <laughs> Technology's broken down, you see? Ah, <laughs> oh, what, 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 what wonderful masters of technology we are. Um, very, yeah. well handled, very well handled, you know? I mean, it didn't break a sweat, you know, just you, you, you dealt with the information and yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's the, there is we, we actually did get one of the simulations officers to is actually connected yeah i've, I've practiced this 10 or 20 times already so it's fine no no but uh, i was going to say we 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 also get into this situation where um we don't realize what we're doing um i mean we we know what we're doing i promise um but but you sometimes lose touch we're working with numbers on a computer screen and things like that and and you you sometimes do lose touch that what we're doing is actually flying missions across the solar system sometimes in those very lucky moments we see our spacecraft now of all the wonderful pictures that come down and there are hundreds of wonderful pictures that come down of planets of the earth of everything else i think the ones certainly we value the most are the ones where you see a bit of satellite in the picture so rosetta took an incredible picture actually it's the philae lander wasn't it looking out yes. across its solar arrays uh, with mars in the background that was and the very first one yeah yeah, and it just it suddenly hit home that this isn't just a pretty picture of Mars, um, which we've all been come so accustomed to, but there's a bit of humanity there as well. There's a bit of something we recognize and it, it puts it all in perspective. And on a more technical level, I think we see it. Sometimes you see sparks of it in our day to day jobs on Mars Express, for example. I always was amazed when we flew out of an eclipse. So uh, every so often we pass behind the planet and uh, we go into the dark and then we come out onto the into the sunlight again. And we've got these very long booms on Mars Express, 40 meter booms, uh, radar booms. Uh, and they heat up at different speeds because one comes out of the shadow first. And so you get this uneven heating down the boom as they come into the sunlight and it causes the spacecraft to do this little dance. Um, very very minor and uh, doesn't affect anything but you see it in the data and suddenly it's not just numbers you see something in the data that's like this is only happening because we have something around another planet that has just burst into the sunlight high over mars and uh, and you see little hints like that 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 take your breath away of course doing things like this is a shortcut because we get to blab on about it for for a while and tell people how exciting it is and uh, we remember what we do well, you know, it's uh, it's it's a lot to take in, I guess. You know, um, just like the immensity of discovery and all that. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, you must have so much pride. <clears throat> excuse me, you must have so much pride in the work that you do. I mean, because you're not just delivering a, a piece of technology to, you know, areas that we've never seen before, um, but what we get back fundamentally changes. The way that we see our world, um, the way that we see our origins, and so on. So once the data starts coming back, describe that feeling of being a part of something so much bigger than any one person's achievement, because it is so many people's achievement. I think it's a bit different there for for Tom and for me, because in the case of uh, of Thomas, he's really working on a important Earth missions, <laughs> critical Earth missions, uh, you know, data that will save people's life uh, in case of flooding, in case of hurricane, um, all this kind of stuff, uh, climate change, all these things. Um, well, in my case, it's more uh, exploration and discovery. So both are extremely thrilling, but in a, in a very different way. Um, and also in the case of science, because we are not scientists um, you know we get the data but we don't understand it we cannot really interpret it um, i'm like anyone if i see a nice picture of um, um, a body in the solar system you know oh yeah that's a piece of planet it's really nice um, but unless someone points out to me yes but look here there's a little crack uh, at this point, this means that maybe on this planet, there's also some kind of tectonic activity. And this is amazing because we didn't know that before. You know, I don't see these things. Um, so I think uh, the feeling is a bit dumped by the lack of understanding. It is. Uh, I think, I mean, we're, yeah. we're all quite modest in, in some areas as well. And um, 
and it's not just modesty it's it's practicality we I, I know i keep going on about teams but there's so many people go into making this happen that that you feel a small part of it but i mean i am very proud to have done it i was very proud when i was on mars express um because that's uh i always say it's it's easier for for the the planetary missions to wow people with it and uh to say well i'm i'm flying a satellite around mars i've taken pictures of mars and people wow you say you're flying around the earth people oh earth that's really boring it's like well <laughs> it is but then it's easier to explain why and i mean there's reasons for for all of it but uh, as armel said that direct connection around earth is something i've been very proud of and actually very humbled of when when you see in the news uh, reports about climate change or now with sentinel one uh, i'm too new on the mission to have seen any direct effects of it but i know many of the times it, it's actually helped people in almost real time on the ground uh, during natural disasters and things like that um it's a very humbling experience to to think that you're you're a part of that and that your work as is, is is a small part of the 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 effort that goes into making these things happen um and so yeah it's uh, makes yeah. me immensely proud that that i can be a, a a cog in that machine so let me just follow up on that, on, on that as, as a scientist who um you know i had the kind of a parallel experience with with the big ground-based telescopes it's become easier and in many cases uh, more common uh for astronomers not to go to the telescopes anymore because you can observe remotely that you, know, you can have people on site taking data you can you can kind of log in and watch the data come back you don't have to travel to these remote locations um, and for me that's actually a real problem because you don't work alongside the people who understand the technology right there and you don't appreciate their role and and, and it's critical that you do that because it is about teamwork and if you you know kind of break into silos and people don't understand what what each job is you're less effective in the end. You, you need communication across those barriers. So I've certainly seen in going to ESOC um, that, you know, sort of not radically, but it, it completely amplified my appre appreciation for the work that goes on there. Because we as scientists often say, you know, point the telescope at this object, take some data, give it back, I'll write the scientific paper. And you forget all of the people in the chain in between. And, and, and that's not a good thing at all. Um, now, I don't want to over romanticize it because, of course, the relationship between the scientists and the spacecraft operations people sometimes is ooh, tasty, let's say, because, of course, the scientists will say, oh, I don't care about this. I, I'm willing to take any risk to get this critical observation. I want to be here doing this right now. And these guys, of course, have to say, oh, no, 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 no. You know, my job is spacecraft safety. I've got to look after everything. I understand you would like to do that, but you have to think of everybody else. So describe a little bit of that, if you can, you know, that, that tension. I've been, in, I've been in some interesting meetings where that, that's come through. It's, it's for the good of the mission, of course, but it's not all sweetness and light. Let's put it that way. No, it's not. And I think the, the description you just gave is, is absolutely correct. It's basically the the fight, well, the, the fight, the, dis, the heavy discussion between wanting to take a picture and how you're going to do it. Um, I like to take the, um, the analogy of um, um, a tour bus, for instance. You know, we, are, we would be uh, the drivers of the bus and the scientists, the older people sitting at the back of the cameras. Um, and then you're driving through a forest and someone would like to take a picture of the very rare birds which are nesting in the trees just above the bus. And they're telling us, yeah, well, you make the bus turn so that we can take the picture of this bird. But that would mean having the bus lie on its side, which is not possible. So, you know, we are trying to tell them, well, listen, we cannot do that because if we do that, the bus will not go anywhere anymore. And we cannot, we just can't. And they are going to answer, yeah, but no, it's easy. You just have to put a rock and then put the wheels of the bus on the rock and then you take the picture and then you remove the rock. So it's, it's, um, I think it's good because it sort of forces us to think of other ways to achieve the observation. Sometimes, you know, there are ideas that come up that we would never have dared doing. Um, but thinking about it, you know, you you maybe find another way to do it and then eventually you can do this operation yeah. so i mean i think that, that flexibility on rosetta was absolutely obvious right at the beginning it seemed to be not rigid exactly but things had to be playing the long way in advance and blocks by the end of the mission it was so much more flexible because you yeah, learn from 
This is also because as a mission gets older, you can afford to take more risks because usually when you start a mission, you have a very specific set of science observations which have to be made. Um, and this is basically the return on, on investment on your mission. So this you have to do. Once this has been done and you've done these critical operations, you can afford to take a bit more risks because the critical stuff has been done already. And the more you go, the more risk you can take and the, the more exciting uh, observations you can make. Yeah, and also I think, you know, the more the trust builds between the teams as well. People see that everybody's working on the same goal. You may come with different constraints and different, um, you know, uh, sort of internal responsibilities. But the longer you work together, I think, it seems to me, uh, the more that you trust that you're all fighting for the same thing. And a bit more give and take and more rapidly arrive at, at, at better conclusions rather than constantly conflict. So you learn how to formulate things as well. Yeah, yeah so that's true. Diplomacy, that's another, and one of the greatest skills in the European Space Agency is often forgotten. <laughs> it's, not, it's not just about pushing buttons, it's about being diplomatic. I'm, I'm terrible at it, but then, you know, there you go. Well, I'm, I'm going to say, very, Mark, that's... Uh... <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested by this to extend the uh, uh, analogy a little bit. So, um, so in this scenario, um, you've got the, uh, the tourists in the back of the bus with the snappy cameras and there's the bus driver mm -hmm. and there's the rare bud there and, um, and nobody agrees on whether the bus can go on its side or not. Uh, who, who decides and who settles it? Because ultimately, somebody's got to make that call. Well, ultimately, that would be the mission manager who has to take um, the last decision. So the person who's responsible at the same time for the science and for the driving. And this person at the end, if people cannot come to a decision, will have to decide we do it or we don't do it. Yeah, and ESA, and ESA for the science missions, at least the, the mission manager lives in the science directorate uh, in, in, in operations. And we have project scientist who is in the same director as well. And then the operations guys who are in a different directorate you know, we're all one agency, but you know, there's different cha chains of management and so on. But it's exactly that. It's the mission manager has the, the ultimate responsibility. Um, and, and it's not an easy call because you will have very, not, yeah, very different inputs. It's, it's mission mm -hmm. manager, and, and I'm saying hi to Fred and anybody else that might be listening. Uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult job because it's a, it's a huge balancing act. It's a big call, big call. I suppose yeah. ultimately everybody wants a successful mission um but uh, i guess uh, they might not always agree on how to do that and uh, actually we've had a really interesting question because we have people who've been watching the show um you know and so we should bring them in to um ask some questions and uh, charles has a really interesting one um you know he, he's asking you know have there been situations where you've had to do something unexpected like a course create uh, a course correction or something like that. I mean, um, I, I, tell us incidents where you've had to make those calls, where you've had to respond to new data and um, you know react and perhaps react quickly. Yeah, I mean, the one that we uh, we deal with in Earth observation now more and more to the point where it's becoming pretty much normal and part of our day to day life um, is space debris, space junk. Um, this is the the big thing that has um, been increasing and increasing and is still increasing, and it's a major issue for us. Um, and that in our day-to-day -day life is is the one that generates those sort of waking up in a cold sweat nights and when your phone rings and, and you get a call. Um, and the nature of, of an alert for space debris is a bit like that as well, because you will get something, uh, you'll get the predictions every day and you'll usually know maybe four or five days before that there's something out there roughly near you, um, but you won't know is it going to hit you or not for until quite close to the event so uh, as the days tick on you get more and more predictions and you see okay it's it's coming closer and it's all a game of probabilities though because of this atmospheric drag um i mean can be variable you can't tell exactly where things are and these things are moving so fast that just a tiny a fraction of a second offset will mean that you pass safely by each other or will mean that you slam into each other uh so but you can't predict all of that. There's just no way to get enough data uh, because our atmosphere alone is is unpredictable uh, by its nature. So you can't perfectly predict where that, whether that thing is going to hit you. So you live in this probability game where you're talking about, okay, what's the risk today? What's the risk this morning with the latest updates? Are we are we below our threshold of uh, and and do we actually do anything? Do we try and move out the way because 
moving out the way would seem like the obvious thing to do. But if this thing is is moving around, are you going to make the problem worse? Are you going to move into the path of something else and things like that? So those calls are are always difficult. And uh, we're working a lot at the moment on trying to automate this process. Um, and that's certainly a very, very important goal for the future to have this be able to be done automatically. But so far, there's been a huge human component, in all of it, because every collision alert is is so very different. Um, the specifics of what's coming to coming at you and uh, what the orbit's like, uh, how well it's tracked, what the object is, what your capability is, uh, what's around you and things like that. So uh, it, it ends up being a very dynamic situation. You have to make calls based on probability, which for us, is very uncomfortable because we, as, as, as engineers and as ops engineers, we love data and facts. We love to see what's happening and know this is what it is, that's what it is. And here you're in this sort of more murky world of probabilities where you have to make a judgment call. And uh, that's certainly um, a, a, a tricky one to do. Uh, luckily, we've always made the right call so far. Um, we've only been hit by one piece of space debris on an ESA satellite and uh, that we it wasn't tracked. So we, we couldn't have known it was coming anyway. Um, Give us a sense of, you know, how much of your daily life this is now. How often does it, for a given satellite that might be in low Earth orbit, one of the Earth observation satellites, is this a daily occurrence, a weekly, a monthly, or yearly at the moment? No, because no. of course, because it's not just junk. Of course, I mean, it's a lot of the stuff behind me as well. It's a vastly increasing number of active satellites which are on trajectories as well. It is, it is, and um, I, I would say, I mean, when you're in your on call week, you every day you will check the the predictions of what's around you, and there will always be a list of tens or 20 things coming close. Uh, I mean, within some kilometers, which is uh, close enough at those speeds to scare you, um, but not close enough to do anything. Um, probably once a month on average, we do keep statistics, but it's uh, because it's again, it's a statistical thing, it'll change. It can be like London buses, nothing will happen for six months and then you'll have three collision alerts in a week. Um, but you're talking that sort of monthly, every couple of weeks frequency. Uh, of course, the more and more Earth observation satellites that we've got, and it's particularly a problem in low Earth orbit, which is one of the most crowded and unregulated orbits. Um, there, the more satellites we have, then those statistics, obviously, you double the number of satellites, you double the number of collision alerts you get. Um, and not all of them mean we actually move. As I say, a lot of them, we will spend quite a lot of time thinking about it, discussing it, and then deciding not to move. Um, but, but yeah, it's it's in that region, and it's only as I say, only increasing, especially with the the launch of mega constellations and things, uh, Starlink being the most famous. Uh, we actually had a collision avoidance with our Aeolus spacecraft and one of the Starlink uh, spacecraft, but there are many other mega constellations being planned at the moment, which will dramatically <coughs> increase the number of objects in, in low Earth orbit. Of course, the Starlink collision was a bit anomalous, not just because it was Starlink, but actually it's very rare for us to have a collision alert with something active. Um, far more often, it's with junk fragments, and almost always that's part of one of two two events. There was uh, the 2007 anti-satellite test by China um, with their weather satellite Fengyong 1C, uh, which they destroyed with an anti-satellite weapon. Um, but it was in a very popular orbit and uh, flooded that orbit with with debris. Um, and then there was also the Iridium Cosmos collision which was the first fully sort of confirmed major collision between two objects, two satellites in space, a commercial satellite called Iridium, a ComSat, and a Russian military satellite called Cosmos. Um, those two hit each other uh, over Siberia and again, created this shower of fragments. And they don't just stay in one place. They, because of the, the quirks of orbital mechanics, they spread out across the orbit. Um, and so, when you look in the morning at your list of potential uh, collision events, then it's almost always Feng Yung 1C Iridium Cosmos, Feng Yung Iridium Cosmos. To see something else is uh, is quite exciting <laughs> in a in a slightly macabre way. Mm. <laughs> but 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 as the, as the satellites get, as there are more active ones. Mm. Who? What are the rules of the road? Who takes responsibility if there are two active satellites under control, and there's a prediction come a week out that it's somebody's job yeah. to move? Who moves? That's the very, very big question. There are no rules at the moment. There are guidelines on how to behave. At the moment, it's all been regulated on a good understanding between spacecraft operators. We generally know that we could call the control room of the other operator and say, look, what's the deal? Who's going to move? Um, and that will be based on very 
pragmatic reasons. Who's got the better maneuvering capability? Uh, who would it hurt or harm more to do the maneuver? Uh, maybe we would say at ESOP, yeah, we've got a, a fantastic space debris office and a fantastic flight dynamics. They can plot our maneuver. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. Um, more worrying is is the possibility that you'll move in the same direction and uh, that's why that coordination is is critical um and there's talk uh, and this was one of the things that that was slightly concerning with the the collision with the starlink is that we were aware that the starlink satellites have a form of autonomous maneuver capability um this has been been mentioned before uh and there was a concern that that if those were to move together um, then we would be in trouble. Now, in the end, that didn't happen. We managed the coordination, and so we safely flew past the object. But autonomous collision avoidance is great, but everyone needs to agree on how it works because you don't want something popping up just as you manually fly up and, and then you still hit each other. But this, um, I mean, we call it space traffic management, um, is a concept and nothing more than a concept at the moment. Uh, there is no central body that regulates it like air traffic control. There's no treaty none of the, the the space treaties that that were produced internationally ever foresaw this amount of uh material in space or this need for coordination it's something that ESA is working very hard on is to try and uh try and push that there is some somebody some some legislation something that will allow us to regulate this in the same way that we regulate air traffic here on earth unfortunately it's not something that can be done alone even all the european nations working together is nowhere near enough it needs to be a global solution and and if one person decides to break it just like if an airplane decides they don't want to listen to air traffic control you have a huge problem um, but yeah. unlike with air traffic control if two planes hit each other um, this is the slightly dark joke made by some of our space debris colleagues. If if two planes hit each other, then air traffic control has two less things to worry about. Um, whereas in space debris, if two satellites hit each other, you've got thousands of more uh, debris objects to, to be concerned about, which pollutes the orbit that it's in. Yeah. yeah. Complex scenarios. And uh, it sounds like, uh, well, um, you know, the, the lives of, uh, uh, I guess, people uh, operating anything in orbit are not getting easier, you know, these days. And, you know, uh, uh, and I, I suppose, um, you know, we've got some really interesting questions just following on from that, just, um, you know, very briefly, how close is too close in orbital uh, distances? Are we talking about within sight, within arm's length, or within kilometers? Yeah, um, certainly in many cases, less than kilometers. We make a big difference between, and I'm going to get technical for a moment, but hopefully I can explain it clearly, uh, between what, what, what we, we call a long track. So um, if the spacecraft's flying, a long track is, is, is when it's is the direction it's traveling and, and radial, which is, is the up and down. So if your spacecraft's going in an orbit, if it goes up or down, um, the reason that we care about those two things is because if you imagine two objects coming together and going to hit each other, if this object is just slightly slower, then this one's going to have flown by um, before it hits. So in that sense, um, we can deal with with uh, quite large uncertainties. So too close in terms of the along track, um, we'll be talking several kilometers. Um, but in the radial, so in this up and down, we know that the satellites don't typically move up and down that much. Even with drag, it'll tend to slow them down or um, and things like that, but they won't tend to go up or down very much. So there we can be talking in the term in terms of um, hundreds of meters uh, or so, uh, where we can say, well, a few hundred meters of separation up or down. We know there's nothing that satellite can do to, to drop into our path. So as long as we've got only a few hundred meters, we're safe there. Um, but our space debris office, we have a, a very good office. In fact, it's one of the, the leading offices in the world at dealing with space debris. Um, they have very good modeling software that sort of shrinks all of these uncertainties. Uh, so different distances uh, in the radial and along track and things like that down into probabilities, into what we call, we have covariance matrices and things, but this, this ultimately boils down to a probability of collision uh, where we say, okay, less than one in a thousand, uh, less than one in 10,000, I think we do something. Um, and we, we then try and uh, we, we, we try and react. Uh, but it's never that simple. It's, um, that's what I talk about, about it always being a discussion. It's never as simple as saying, well, one threshold, we do it or we don't do it. We, we look at the situation that we're in. We look at um, 
what the object is, what the collision geometry is like, and, and we make a decision there. So the <clears throat> it's actually not terribly dissimilar to air traffic kinds of separations in altitude and uh, uh, in, you know horizontal separation as well. Typically kilometers and then hundreds of meters or half a kilometer up and down. So Very much even though so, space yeah. is awf awfully much bigger, um, it's it, it, yeah. I'm just trying to work out which way the metaphor goes. You can actually be fairly close. Um, and not be in danger. Uh, probably due down to the predictability, as you said, the fact that things don't change very much. Yeah, because in of the certain low directions, though. And this yeah. is the this is the difference. I mean, some people say, oh, well, with better observations, could we predict for sure what's going to collide and and things like that? Or can you tell me next month what's going to hit what? And and the atmosphere in in low Earth orbit, particularly, the atmosphere is the big unknown factor there, and and the atmosphere is random it, and the atmosphere is also influenced by the sun and in fact uh, solar weather causes our atmosphere to expand and contract which directly links to more or less drag on our satellite and that drag is what's changing our orbit um, but these things are random systems i mean mathematically scientifically random systems um, where we cannot predict what they're going to do so uh, that's what adds an element of craziness to the whole uh, mm -hmm. situation <laughs> Well, it sounds like a lot of fun. And I, I suppose, Arnold, I mean, you've, um, you know, uh, obviously, without question, dealt with unpredicted scenarios and things that, have, you know, force you to respond quickly. And I suppose, uh, you know, uh, I guess, in tandem with so many other people as well. I mean, what, what was the, uh, the, the journey with Rosetta like? And uh, uh, what were those scenarios? Well, I think reacting quickly does not really apply actually to uh, interplanetary missions. Um, again, because they're so far away, so you cannot physically react quickly because when you see that there's something happening on board, it actually already happened like 20 minutes ago. Um, so actually the first rule is always wait. Um, the spacecraft, is usually um, very well automated and very able to uh, save itself and to recover from failures. Um, in terms of collisions, it does not really happen a lot because space is very empty. Um, even around Mars, where we are starting to have quite a few satellites and we are uh, even starting to have debris uh, as well, I think in the case of TGO, we had um, two close encounters when we were doing uh, the aerobraking. So we were using the, the Martian atmosphere to slow down the spacecraft and to diminish the, the, the size of the orbit to come uh, closer to the, to the ground. And doing so, we crossed the orbit of a, a couple of uh, other spacecrafts. Um, what we did in this case was to um, slow down our spacecraft a little bit by doing a maneuver to change the phase of uh, the orbit. This means that um, if one spacecraft was on an orbit around Mars and another one was in a crossing orbit around Mars, we did maneuver such that the spacecraft would be on the other side of the planet when we crossed its orbit. So it's a bit of, of Tetris, really. <clears throat> but again, it does not really happen quick. It's uh, in the case of planetary, it's usually it's usually yeah days, if not more. Um, maybe what happens is uh, the quickest reaction you you have to have is when you have a major failure on board with uh, um, what we call a safe mode. So that's a, a reboot of the onboard computer. Um, but again, usually the first thing you do is wait for the spacecraft to stabilize, to finish the reboot, to come to a, a stable situation, and then you jump in and you start reconfiguring. So <clears throat> one of the most famous reboots, to... one of the most famous reboots, of course, occurred on uh, January the 20th, uh, 2014. Um, remind us what that experience was like. Uh, okay, was we're all waiting for the signal from Rosetta to come back when exactly. it came out of hibernation. That was the day of the wake up for Rosetta, and uh, it was expected within, um, yeah, some tens of minutes uh, due to the uncertainty of the, the counter, the wake up call on board when the spacecraft started to wake up and how long it would take to warm up. 
Um, but what happened is that during this reconfiguration, during this wake up, the spacecraft actually triggered another safe mode. Um, so we had to wait an extra 45 minutes, which is the duration of the reconfiguration on board. Um, and at this point, we were really starting to scratch our head and to think, okay, the spacecraft is not coming back. What should we do? Do we need to try and, uh, and call it to see it would, uh, if it would answer? Um, but we had procedures about that and they were very, very clear. We had to wait. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a famous picture, as you know, from the control room on that day with uh, when, when the signal did come back with Andrea Akamatsu, you know, pumping his fist and, and uh, Manfred Varhout there with both of his fists. And Paolo Ferri, is, it's interesting, Paolo's in his jacket and tie already, which he wasn't wearing up until that point, but he put the jacket and tie on because he was preparing to walk over to the main, uh, the main building and tell the press, yeah, it's not happening today, you know, we, we'll come back tomorrow and we'll see what's happened. So I was like the fact that that picture shows kind of a, a moment in time where kind of the, and then the signal came and yeah, I mean, well, you, you know, far better than me what that felt like. I mean, it was just an astonishing, almost built in, right? I mean, if it if it had come on time, we'd all have just clapped and said, oh, boring. Yes, it's it's back, but <laughs> extra 45 minutes. So well, you need did. a bit of drama, otherwise it's... Uh, well, we were, I, I was accused on television later on of it all being fake, that we did that actually deliberately to get the drama. But uh, yeah, I, I don't think so. Well, uh, uh, I have to say an absolutely fascinating discussion of uh, just astonishing technical achievements, but also uh, the, the human factor behind it that I think, uh, I think it's a powerful reminder of just what an investment it is of people's time, you know, their hopes and uh, just incredible expertise as well. Um, I have to say on behalf of everyone who has been watching and uh, everyone at Space Rocks as well, Tom and Armel, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you for having Good us. Job. Very good. And, uh, and you, don't you, get to, you don't get to leave, of course. You, you, you both know the drill, right? You've been practicing your Vulcan salute. Uh, or space rocks. Right, you nice. it, it, oh, now, the other one, way around. Yeah, thumb out to one side. Yeah, well, exactly. So thumbs out, thumbs out. The full Vulcan salute's got the oh, thumb the full, here as full. well. Yeah. Which side am I on? This side. <laughs> Come on, Armel. Yeah. One, one more time. Uh, nice one. <laughs> thumbs in that side thumbs out that side this is very complicated more complicated it is very you, we, we, we'll have you back so you can practice <laughs> it's next because time. the picture is reversed <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right that's the excuse very good very, very good uh tom and armel again thank you so much once again for your time and uh we'll very hope to see you again very soon okay. thanks both talk to you soon bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Okay, bye.